Hi, this is Dave Pryor. Welcome to Leading Agile Sound Notes. Today, we're going to talk all about the PMO and Marty Bradley, who is an SVP and an executive consultant at Leading Agile, has uh, taken some time out of his day. We're going to talk about the blog post that he put up recently about whether or not the PMO should go away and talk about what a PMO can do to stay relevant in an environment that is transforming over to Agile. So, Marty, thank you very much for taking time out of your morning. Hey, thanks, Dave. Appreciate um, it. Before we get started, can you explain to the folks who are listening what uh, what executive consultants actually do? Because that's a little bit different than a straight up agile coach, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, so you know what happens is is that a lot of times, uh, and especially historically, agile coaching meant you know you would come in and and coach teams. A lot of times, the coaches would um, basically report into a program manager, and you'd go program to program and kind of do a transformation from the bottom up, right? Um, what we do from uh, a leading agile from an executive coaching standpoint is we work more with uh, the business, right? So we come in and, and what we try to do is, is focus on business capabilities, basically the what the company's good at, not necessarily how they do it. And then and then we focus on how do we govern the flow of value as opposed to just doing an agile transformation. And that has a tendency to touch uh, all parts of the organization, right? HR and all those other things. So um, when I when I come into a transformation, I'm looking more at the executive level things and how we how we make sure that the transformation is successful for the business. Okay. Do you find that, um, just as a side question before we get into the PMO, do you find that executives are, are getting more, becoming more aware of understanding what that transition means when they start to walk into it, like from, from their perspective of change? I, I think they do. I think one of the one of the issues that we run into, it's always interesting, is that I'll have executives uh, say to me, stop saying agile. Um, sometimes. And, and when I hear that, what that's kind of telling me is that they've kind of tried to go agile a couple of times. The IT department has really latched onto it and tried to force the term up. And the business itself, the guys that are running the things day to day, yeah, don't care, right? They, they really don't care. They think it's, hey, we, you just want to, okay, IT is going to change the way they do things. I don't really care about that. Just let me keep getting <laughs> Get my the way I used to give them. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, when I hear that, it's actually a good thing, right? Because they, they want to change the way we're talking about things, right? And that's why, like you heard Mike say, talk about the flow of value and things like that. So right. when, you, when you get to that and, and, and you're focused on that level and the metrics are around, you know, what value are de- delivering, not what practices have you learned, then, yeah, they're, they're completely engaged. And that's, that's the conversation they want to have with you. Okay, cool. All right, so this is sort of, a, I guess, in my head at least, maybe not for the rest of the world, it's a segue into the PMO discussion. So the blog post that you had was trying to respond to the question of should the PMO go away? So can you explain a little bit about sort of the background of that premise and what you're trying to address with it? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, like, you know, we've all seen, right? Like, you know, you've read uh, the, the Scrum book from way back, right? And when you're taking a small team, you know, it's basically kind of culture driven, right? Where Everybody's like, hey, let's be agile and send, let's do agile and, and, and let's be very agile about everything we do. And, and, you know, in a small group, like I had a startup, that was great, right? You could do that. We didn't need a lot of um, tracking. We didn't need a lot of reporting. I mean, we were turning out software basically every day and we could tell if it worked, right? So, so, so that works out great, right? But what happens in a larger organization, um, <laughs> you know, the PMO is thought of as this organization is just kind of beating people down, right? And so where I normally get the question from first is as soon as you start engaging the teams, um, they're like, well, I heard with Agile, the PMO can go away and, and we don't need all this tracking and we don't have to have Gantt charts and, and all this other stuff. And that would be cool not to be in these four-hour meetings trying to explain to everybody what we've been doing. And, and, it, and it makes sense from their standpoint, right? Because it feels like a waste of time, right? They're in these meetings, they're trying to explain what's going to be in the release, and they don't really know. They're committing to dates before they know what they're committing to. And then they have this group that's basically now chasing them to the date. Uh, and, and in Agile, you know, we talk about how, um, you know, the lack of, you don't need as much documentation. And so, of course, everybody goes to, great, <laughs> I don't have to. I don't have to create a schedule anymore. Exactly, I don't have to yeah. do this. I don't have to do this, right? And um, the interesting thing is, is that what they're doing is they're jumping all the way to perfect agile, 
And, and, and so what I normally have to do is kind of step them back. And, you know, I know, I know Mike has talked about the three things, but just briefly, it's, you know, why does Agile work, right? You have, um, you have clarity in the backlog, you have teams that are focused on getting their work done, and you have working tested software. So in theory, that's perfect, right? And then when you grow that, you just need to scale it, right? You have multiple backlogs, so you need some sort of governance flow. And, and again, very cool, seems very straightforward, but the problem is, is that organizations have built up all kinds of extra stuff to protect themselves, right? So we have, you know, some companies call them stage gates or, uh, you know, you have release planning meetings and then everybody's got to agree to exactly what's going to be in the, in the release. And in Agile, that doesn't make sense to people, right? But at the same time, the business has to tell their customers that, hey, in three months, we expect these features to come out. Right. So, yeah, you, so you have to come up with some, some way to deal with that, the, the dichotomy that you've now created, right? On one half, we're like, we don't need schedules anymore. And on the other half, it's like, hey, we still have commitments to customers. So what happens is, is that, of course, development um, or some factions in the organization think that, great, that means let's get rid of all these extra people that we have that we're just kind of chasing people down. And if, if you look at a, a structured approach uh, to a transformation, the very first thing we, need, we usually do when we go in is we just want to get uh, predictable. And by doing that, you really don't gain the advantages necessarily of Agile immediately, right? It's like, so becoming predictable doesn't mean you're going to get like 30, 40% you know, growth now all of a sudden because now you're Agile. But what it does is it gives you a place to start making changes from. Right. It gives you a stable base that you can now start to go, <clears throat> hey, we have these extra people managing schedules. Do we still need those people? Well, in this part of our organization, we do because we have 13 teams that are working on this thing and they're so tightly coupled. There's a lot of organization and dependencies that we have to manage. Well, you can't expect each individual team to manage those. Right. That's something perfect for um, that's what a PMO was originally set up for. Yeah, but right? hold, hold on one second. So if I've sure. if I've read a couple of these Agile books, I have a bunch of questions I want to ask you about this stuff you just said. But if I've read these sure. Agile books, I'm going to play the opposite side of it. Those teams are supposed to be self organizing. They're supposed to figure this out. Well, that's that's true. But at the same time, what happens is is that the business is still moving, right? And the teams. At, it, the organization has these dependencies and these orchestrations and these things that they have to do. Maybe it's compliance issues. Maybe it's SOX, um, SOX compliance from a financial standpoint. Maybe they're, they're um, you know, drug company where they have to do certain types of testing at certain stages of these things. Some of the people in the self-forming teams understand that. Others have never been exposed to that level of coordination. Right. So if the coordination is still at such a high level where they haven't kind of distributed that down, that's where the, the problem comes in. You have these teams that don't really understand what that forming means or they're not actually given the ability to form. Right. Which means we have teams that they are supposed to be stable at, or at least consistent. And you'll have four or five of those members pulled out of the team constantly because there's some issue in an old version of the software and only these five guys know about it. Right. So you have a lot of organizational and technical debt that you need to iron out before you can kind of take some of this scaffolding down. Okay, so so if I want to see if how you feel about the, what this statement I'm about to make that I would say a lot of the traditional process has been put in place um, out of a complete lack of trust. I think in in your article you you mentioned the lack yep. of trust. I would say I always say because people are idiots. If I don't tell people what to do, they're going to do stupid things. And isn't that a reason why we can't have self-organizing teams? Because that might work in some other agile company, but our company's special and different. And these guys don't know what the hell they're doing. We have to have those stage gates, otherwise we're going to just—it's never going to work. And I won't know what's well, going on. Well, and and that's exactly right, right? So I had—I'll um, take a simple transformation that I did, right? I had a Kanban team that their their whole focus was to keep the organization running. Right. They had old software that they were rewriting, but the, the key component, there was this team and that's their whole job was just to do maintenance on this. They were delivering um, three or four times a week into production. What was happening is, is that the people that knew better, that had all of these rules about the way to do things, were forcing the teams to develop and deploy things 
And the team actually knew that it was bad for the company, but they didn't have any authority to stop it because nobody trusted them, right? They put basically what they thought were the worst developers on this most important team. <laughs> and these guys were pumping out defects like crazy, right? And they're right. like, they were good at deploying defects. They could do it constantly. When they would do a deployment, because there were so many defects going out, what they did was to solve the problem was they had 20 people on the phone during a deployment. Literally 20 people, right? So as the guy, and everybody was on, on um, uh, a WebEx, and there was the guy that was doing the deployment, running SQL code and pushing it to all the servers, and there were a bunch of developers watching, making sure everybody's doing everything right, and then there was a manager and a QA guy and all that, right? And so they would start a deployment at 10 o'clock at night, and it would go usually till just about 6 a.m. the next morning, right? So think about what that does to people, right? It kind of demoralized them, especially because... The reason that they were, that was a problem was because the people that knew better were actually causing the problem. But that, isn't that the predictability you were asking for? It, it, well, exactly. But the problem is, is that the, the uh, people running the show are so used to getting things late because this goes back to your trust issue, right? They're right. so used to missed deadlines and not understanding why the deadlines are getting missed because we're using measurements that are too long, right? Like if I have a six-month release... And you say to a developer, hey, can you do this? He's like, well, yeah, sure, right? Because he's thinking about what you're asking for, and he's got another five months. Sure, So everything feels really doable, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what we do in Agile is we bring all that stuff back, right? We make it smaller. So those decisions are, are actually realistic, right? Like, can you get this done in two days? No. Okay, why not? Because of this, this, and this. Okay, cool. Let's put that in the next sprint. And now you can kind of manage those smaller chunks and you can move those around, right? Okay. So less and less, you need somebody tracking the overall schedule as to where you are because you're getting that feedback on a regular basis, right? You're seeing that every week or every two weeks. So now you can start pushing the onus to the product owner as to, am I getting the right thing in the product, right? Now I don't need, I don't need a program manager to be tracking where I am in the project, right? Okay. I have the product owner, the person that cares, managing that or looking at that, making sure that the value is getting it. Okay, so if I work in a PMO and I see you enter the building, I got to I got to work on my resume because I'm scared <laughs> now because my job's going to go. Well, I, I get that's the, so you talk about the PMO. I, my question is for the people in the PMO: Is there anything they can do to? shift the focus or the mission of the PMO to maintain relevancy and to be something that is not this barrier, this controlling, do it this way, where's your form thing, to something that supports the transition. Well, and, and that's really the thing, right? The good PMOs that I've worked with, when I've gone in and it's a PMO that's supporting the transformation, what they're looking at is, okay, I know we have these barriers. So which are the things that we still need as a company? Like, so for example, if I'm a a medical company and I have to do a review because um, in, in order to classify for Medicaid and, and to work with Medicaid patients, I have to do these type of things and I have to do these type of certifications. Right. They should be keeping in, like, what are the processes that we still need to keep in place even when we go agile that may be a little less than agile, right? Because these things may be very stage gate oriented because they're government, you have to do this and you have to do this, you have to do this, Right. So they can kind of manage that flow and then look at what are the pieces in the organization that we put in place to protect ourselves because we kept delivering poor quality software. So now we're going to turn that back to the teams. And, and so the PMO should almost become almost the coaching organization. How do we get agile? How do we, how do we keep the agile mindset, right? Like how do we make sure that we're going back and doing continuous improvement? Because when you go into the teams – the teams will continuously improve inside themselves a lot of times right. and forget about the organization as a whole, right? They're not necessarily looking at the whole, uh, the lead time from, you know, inception to delivery. So what I'd like to see is the PMO to start to back up and do more of that. It's like, okay, so how do I keep everybody focused on lead time from inception to delivery? Because we get very focused on when it gets down to the program layer and we have a product owner from that inception to delivery. But what about the executives that come up with a great idea at the portfolio level? How do you track that? Make sure that that happens in a, in a, in a fast manner, right? Yeah. Development, a little too focused, a little lower, right? So PMO organization, if they focus at that level and start becoming really more business consultants, 
then, then um, that's when they start to help with the transformation. And that's when you start to see the increase in um, the value of, of Agile. So do you think that we need to have, and one of the things I keep thinking about is the folks in the PMO, I mean, they've, they've trained in project management or whatever. Um, they've worked on all this governance stuff. And now this is a massive, they're just, they're not only responsible for watching the organization transform, but on a personal level and a career level, this is a massive job shift for them as well. Do you think that organizations need to have a, have more empathy for the PMO? I mean, do you, do you think that they're just supposed to, should we just expect them to make this change or is there stuff we have to do to support them learning how to make the change? Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, um, I look at the PMO and development managers kind of the same, right? You, you have to have a lot of empathy for the fact that they need to change because it is kind of a struggle. Um, you know, with the PMO, they're looking at knowing that, that the way they do things are going to change, but they can't change what they're doing right now, right? Because right? what they're doing right now is keeping the company on point, right? They're making sure the product goes out the door. So you can't, that can't go away until the organization trusts that the product is going to go out the door. So on one hand, they need to move past it, but on the same hand, they have to stay stable, right? So they're basically, they're, they're doing two jobs at once, right? They're doing their old PMO stuff and, and they're changing. Now, the quickest thing for them to do is to change that as fast as they can. So some of the reporting structures that they put in place, like, like you'll see a lot of times a PMO will have a very standard monthly report that every project has to do. One of the first things they can do to kind of work themselves into the transformation is to change their focus on what are the metrics we should be collecting that show the business that we're gaining value, right? So then what it does is it changes the focus um, from the transformation onto how do we deliver value faster? And then now they start getting invited to the meetings that, that matter, that help them, that are higher in the business as opposed to getting pushed down into scrum master roles or, um, you know, being a, a, a RTE if you're safe or something like that. Right. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's a, it's a big, um, it's a massive head switch for them, I think. Yeah. And, and, and we see it in development managers too, right? Where development managers sometimes have a tendency to become like the Uber program manager, right? Like yeah. if there's a problem in their group. <laughs> somebody calls that guy and goes, what's going on? Why are we late? And, and now all of a sudden he's got to stop, drop and roll. And, you know, he's pointing fingers and yelling at everybody, grabbing the program manager. And it's like, dude, you're creating more of a problem <laughs> than yeah. you're helping, right? We need to shift you over to here. But, but the thing is in a transformation, and I know I've done this, where you kind of forget to include those people, right? Because they're still, they're still incredibly important to the organization, right? They got to that position somehow. So, you know, they should be more focused on how do I facilitate the team? You know, how do I build a better infrastructure so that, you know, I can pop up, um, a, you know, a new, a new team in like two hours, right? Like they have all the servers set up, blah, 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 and team's ready, right? So now I can pop up a team or, to, you know, things like that, right? They should be focusing on the fun part of their job, not the, oh my God, it's going to be late again. And now I'm going to get yelled at part of the job. Well, I think it's fun, but it's also, I mean, you can also make the case to say, well, you know, we've got to switch to agile and they can look around their giant office and say, I got this giant office through a waterfall. The hell do I want to switch to Agile for? I mean, you tell me I'm going to deploy a team in an hour. Why do they need me then? I'm eliminating myself. So it, I guess it is fun and challenging, but probably scary too. Well, yeah, it's very scary, right? I, 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 get, I, get, I get a lot of the same questions that I get from development managers as I do the PMO, right? Like we'll, we'll sit in and the ones I like the best are the guys that are the most honest, right? They sit down and go, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. Right. And when you have somebody that is basically looking at you saying, like, this is my job. I got a family. Right. What am I supposed to do? Right. And, and that's when you realize that, you know, you know, we could do some of our transformations better so that we kind of help position um, them in the right place, because then they'll become um, they'll help the transformation more than detract from it. Yeah. Uh, and 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 when, when I've when I've done that, it's it's gone better. But you know, again, most organizations, it's hard to hire good people, right? So if you're there and you've gotten to that level, nobody wants to get rid of you, right? The organization does not want to fight. Like you have too much, too much knowledge about the organization, right? So the, the best thing to do is to rework and see how you fit. But again, you know, whenever things change, the easiest place is to move up, not down, right? So when you're in any kind of transformation, it's just like when a company comes in and acquires 
that's actually a great time for good people that are that are knowledgeable, right? That's when you can grow your career, right? You start looking around for the gaps ahead of you and you go help and try to fill those. Yeah, one of the things you just said, I got kind of stuck on it, was I'm starting to wonder now if like in an organization, if I'm if we're transitioning or whatever, um, I've got somebody who's got a massive amount of domain knowledge. Can their ability to learn new things and change keep pace or ride just slightly ahead of the value of that domain knowledge because the domain knowledge without the ability to change is useless. Like you have to right. have both and there's got to be some kind of balance in there where one doesn't just kill the other. Oh, absolutely. And that's a tricky absolutely. thing. Um, so what do you have, when you go into an organization, is there something you mentioned you get all the same questions most of the time. Is there something you wish the PMO leaders knew before you got there that would make this just a lot easier on them and on you when they're going through transformation? Yeah, I think, I think if they knew that not every piece of the organization had to be perfect agile, it would help, right? Because, you know, we go through this transformation and, and uh, you know, a lot of people, and, and you know, you, I, know you, I know you've seen this, right, where they go and they take a pilot team and they move it right over to a kind of almost like a lean startup, right? And they set up the environment and it's perfect for them. And of course, they're going to be successful, right? They've shaved all the all the nonsense away, yeah. And they've created this perfect little incubator, right? Which is great, right? Problem is that doesn't scale through the organization, right? Because you have to deliver something. Yeah, you have customers that are expecting a feature in a month, right? Right. And trying to teach everybody how to be lean like that at the beginning just not going to happen in a month. I mean, if we're being realistic. But the other the the other side of that is that. You may have an organization that's just, and maybe software that's just so tightly coupled that you can't break up. There's maybe there's five teams involved. Breaking them apart, the disruption to do that may not get you. If if it's not going to increase the value for the business exponentially, it's like, do you really need to do that? Maybe all you need to do is get them stable, deal with the dependencies, right? So this is a place where part of the PMO may still exist forever. Part of, you know, the manage the dependencies, let the team focus on the dependencies and then just have somebody do some oversight to make sure we're hitting dates. But that they may be good enough, right? Add some automation, get them to what we consider a base camp three. So they have some automation, they have predictability, they're delivering quality software, but there's still some coupling and things like that that they have to deal with, right? Probably doesn't make sense to re-architecture that whole solution to do that. Now, you may have, like I worked, um, one of the transformation I did was with a, um, a, uh, a medical company and they were reviewing charts. And one of the things that they would do is the auditors would have these uh, ideas for algorithms to find different information in the charts that would help them understand that maybe they can go find money here. That's like a perfect lean startup thing because what they do, they have an algorithm team and it's very, it's like AI and a little bit of uh, uh, heuristics. So it's kind of complicated coding, but they can turn it around in a couple of weeks and then put it out, see if it's getting them the charts they want. If it is, then they'll fine tune it and keep going that direction, right? That's a great lean startup thing. If, if they don't like it, they kill it and they're done, right? So this team basically works on two week cycles. The rest of the organization wasn't anywhere near ready to do that. But because, because they figured out, so what we do is we spent time on how do we get them lean startup? And then how do we now plug that in faster to the old, to the teams in the old structure? So it was a little bit of a change on how they did deployments, but you know, you basically took one section of the organization, got them lean startup very quickly, and then just made the rest of the organization predictable. Right now, they could have they could have stopped there, but there, there are other things that they want to do, and so they're going to continue along the transformation path. Okay, cool. So I have two more questions, and I think they're kind of short. Um, if I am in a PMO and I'm listening to this podcast and I'm not very familiar with a lot of this stuff, you've talked about a bunch of different things. So you've talked about, you mentioned Kanban. We've obviously talked about Agile. You mentioned Lean Startup. Um, if I'm trying to get up to speed to the point where I work in a PMO and I can sit in a room of Agilists and not sound like an idiot, what are the things I, what are a couple more things that I need to learn about to be part of that conversation? I, I think. Well, I don't think that um, everybody needs to be a scrum master. Okay. I think there are things that you may not need to read, but if your organization is going through a transformation, yeah. if you're in the PMO, I would suggest you find a team that you think is functioning well and go sit in on the team. Right? Just watch them work. 
Yeah, watch them work. Work okay. with the and and ask you know carve off some time afterwards and ask some questions. Right? I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of books on program management and how to go agile and 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 even and and honestly, even the safe like um, Dean's books about how do you how do you manage an organization going to a, a you know scaled environment. A lot of that information is good, right? And it, and again, what it does, it focuses on metrics. So, um, you know, I would read books on how do I measure value. I'd look at my company and figure out what is value in my company. So that, right? that was my next question was how do I, cause value is sort of like be good. I mean, it's just, it's such a strange yeah. thing to define. How, how do you, what direction do you point people in when they're trying to get an answer to that? Well, there's two things and this is going to sound horribly like a consulting answer, but you know, Ryan, Reiner Stein in his book, right? Like, so when you're doing prioritization, he tells you, if you can't figure anything else out, look at uh, costs of delay. Right. So a lot of organizations, cost of delay is easy to figure out because they either have regulatory things that they have to sit hit by a certain date. They have sales guys that have committed things to customers by a certain date. Right. And and so you have to understand from your organizational standpoint, is that important to your revenue stream? Right. Now, you may not be able to tag a specific value to it. Right. But if you look at those two things and then you and then this is where you have to start building the trust in the organization. If you have a product owner and, and the assumption is the product owner is always building the backlog based on highest priority first uh, and most valuable, then if they know the organization, it is going to increase the value. It's going to be hard to measure, right? But it, it will increase the value. Now, the thing is, is that some organizations can actually measure it through productivity gains and things like that. So again, if I'm part of the PMO, what I'm going to look at is can I find things in my organization? Like, so for example, in this auditor case, is an auditor more successful if he's making more revenue or is it finding more charts? So is it the revenue I want to measure or the number of charts he goes through in a day? Right. Right. And, 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 and basically do some analysis on that and then run some reports and see if you see it trending the right way. Okay. So it's gonna. It is going to depend on an organization. They have to find their own answer for what value actually means. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. It, it's back in the old day. Like I remember, you know, being a product manager for a software company, and you know, I'd get all kinds of Gartner reports, and and you know, I'd run some numbers and do basic percentages and blah blah blah, and I would say, okay, if we do these ten features, it's going to increase the value by ten million dollars, and I was basically pulling numbers out of my butt. Right. Okay. I mean, you don't know. I mean, you can't really know for sure. Um, and unless, unless you can deliver something and see the increment grow, right? So if you're not delivering everything, something every two weeks, it's really hard to tell what 12 features, which one of them actually is increasing the value. Yeah. Right. Cool. All right, Marty, thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. So if you're listening to the podcast, there's going to be a link to Marty's article. I will also make sure to include a link that explains cost of delay and some of the other stuff that we've talked about in the podcast, just in case you're not totally up to speed on it. And Marty, if they want to get in touch with you uh, with follow-up questions, what's the best way to do that? Um, uh, my leading agile email address, uh, marty.bradley at leadingagile.com. Okay, cool. And I'll make a, sure there's a link to that as well. Thank you very much, man. All right. Thanks. Thanks.